This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everybody. Um, calling this meeting of Board of Directors, January 22nd to order. Um, first item, <clears throat> are there any public comments? Uh, Yes, hi, uh, this is uh, Bob Maddox. Um, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment. Um, first, I just wanna thank you all for all your hard work. Uh, as a former member of a credit service board, I, it's really important what you're doing. But uh, what I'm calling you about is something that is related to your work, but not directly, and I'll, I'll be very quick. I'm sure we've all received a ton of those unsolicited robocalls. It seems that, hey, do you have solar is on the list. And after receiving about a dozen phone calls from uh, unsolicited uh, uh, robocall, I decided to follow through on it to say, okay, who is behind this? And lo and behold, it's a company called Monument Solar claiming to be based out of Stanford, Connecticut. At least they have a website. My reason for bringing this to you is that obviously the regulation of robocalls I know is beyond the scope of your organization, but the Green Bank does provide um, incentives to solar installers or to customers of solar installers. And I guess I would request that you seriously consider requiring all solar installers that want to qualify for Green Bank incentives to sign marketing agreements agreeing to follow do not call lists and also to engage in what i call ethical marketing standards i'm sure like all of you you're tired of robocall after robocall and in my case it's actually ridiculous because i already have solar a solar system up um so that's really what i was calling for i really was personally frustrated i'm sure all of you are also with robocalls and realize that it is an area where the Green Bank could help to clamp down on this. And to think that this is one, lo and behold, last night I get another robocall from a company called US Solar. Um, I didn't do research to see if they're a real company or, or a front company, but I think you're gonna see more and more of this. And um, given the high standards of what the Green Bank has done, I think this is another opportunity where you can take a leadership role in cracking down on this nonsense. So thank hey, you Bob, for hearing me Bob. out. Thanks, Bob. What's the name of the company again? We have monthly meetings with the Department of Consumer Protection. Maybe this is something right. we can raise. If what what's the name no. of the Stanford company? Mon Mon Monumentum Solar. Um, you know, and it's just uh, I, I think that you're going to see more and more of this. Which you know, I'm not I'm not opposed to obviously marketing. I think that's great, but enough is enough when they're not consulting. Do not call lists, and they continue to call. Uh, time and again. Um, so that's, that's yeah, sort of why. I'll, uh, I'll work with the RCIV team, and this is something we could raise with Department of Consumer Protection. And we'll look at our marketing requirements right now. We do have them under the RCIV uh, program and see if they are violating any of those do not call lists and things like that. I, we, I think we've all gotten right. the call. So I, I can look into that, Bob. Right. I'd be happy to. And I'm glad okay. it's a Connecticut right. company. It'll be a little easier to get our, uh, get, get to them. Great. So again, thank you so much. That's all I was calling for. And again, I, I appreciate so deeply all the work you guys do. Um, this is uh, Lonnie. Bob, you also said you got a call from US Solar last night, but you haven't had a chance to check them yeah. out. Yeah, I, and some of these companies aren't actually real. They'll call and say, hey, I'm calling from Energy Networks. I think what the industry works is that the solar company hires a telemarketer to do the calling for them for lead generation, and then it's referred over to them. I just, with the first company, just finally got sick of it, um, uh, you know, and said, hey, you know, enough is enough. This is an all a dozen phone calls I'm getting. Well, thanks for your input. Sure. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, that takes us to agenda item number three, which is the meeting minutes for uh, December 18th. Um, 
do I hear um, a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, this is John Harity, motion to approve. Any second? Do I hear a second? Board members must be on mute. <laughs> I can. Bonnie, this is Brenda. I'm actually abstaining because I, I didn't attend the meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, you're there. Oh, good, Brenda. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> what about Mike? Mike, do we hear a second? Yeah, Mike, please. Uh, I second. I had double muted myself on night. Only unmuted myself in one spot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Madam Chair. Aye. Oh, Madam yes. Chair, this is this is Eric. Uh, I just want to confirm what we're voting on. Um, I actually think I had a solo solar robocall come in, and I oh. pushed the button, say sorry, I can't talk. And of course, if it's a robocall, uh, I, I can't accept that, so I got disconnected. So a very timely uh, discussion wow. earlier. <laughs> but if we're on the minutes, <laughs> if we're on the minutes. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I didn't answer it. All I tried to do was reject it. But, you know, if you try and reject a, a robocall, uh, it, it, they can't accept um, responses. So um, I didn't realize I get disconnected from this call. But at any rate, sorry to delay. If this is on the minutes, I vote in favor. Good, good. It is on the minutes. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. Ay, 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 All right, I'm going to call them pass. Um, let's see, the, um, the fourth item on the agenda are uh, committee updates and recommendations, and I think that's Eric and Brian. Perfect, Progress yes. Targets. Yes, uh, Chair Reed. Let me turn uh, the... The discussion over to uh, Eric Strago and um, John Harity. Uh, Eric, we'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Brian. So um, now is the time when we typically come back to the board with our um, recommendations on um, targets for the full year based off of what we've seen um, this year. As you may recall, we originally came to the board with a range of targets so a uh, best case and a best guess so a low and a high um and um after seeing six months of performance we're able to say hey we were right or no we need to tweak it and for the most part um we um we did pretty good at the start but i mean we have seen um some things in the market that do want us to uh, that do make us want to adjust um, the targets. So I'll start with the incentives business, um, incentive programs. So we're looking to um, keep the total number of projects the same. We do think that we're going to surpass that lower in the, the lower target. Um, we should be we're going to bump the higher um, as far as the um but so, excuse me sorry we're going to surpass the lower end of that range um and what we're looking to change is we're actually going to increase the amount of capital deployment here um and that is due to the increased solar that's being installed we are going to be cutting back our battery storage targets uh, we had originally said that we might do up to 400 projects this year. We're saying 100. I don't. I think we're we'll probably be on the lower side. We do have an update on some battery storage developments, but Brian will um, provide that at a later point. Um, and thus far in the year, we've seen greater uptake in RSIP than we had originally predicted, and great, which means greater uptake in positogen. Um, and similarly, we have done better than we initially expected for smart E. So those are offsetting the cuts in the battery storage. Um, so ultimately we expect to up that target of capital deployed, the lower band of 100 to 100 million. And we expect to increase installed capacity um, to 
somewhere between uh, 27 megawatts and 41 and a half megawatts. Um, next slide. So coming to the financing programs, um, we're, our main change here is um, our, is with the number of projects, and that has to do with uh, shoring up the projects that are going to get done um, through the state, uh, through the Green Bank Solar PPA. That those have started to solidify much more. We have the details in the projects, and so we we kind of um, we're able to talk about that with much more certainty than we were previously. Um, CPACE, the number staying pretty much the same as what we had. I think there were a couple of true ups with the um, Green Bank Solar PPA, but nothing uh, significant to speak of. SBEA, um, as well as staying, we're keeping that target. And the same thing with the multifamily programs and our strategic investments. So overall, for this line of our business, we are shoring up the number from between 1,267 and 1,300 projects to between 1,267 and 1,273. Uh, in terms of capital deployment, uh, being that we now know the size of the state projects, that's allowed us to hone that number. Uh, so that will be between 46.1 and 69 million. And then in terms of installed capacity, um, we think we'll come in probably closer to that 20 megawatts installed. And that again is due to the PPA projects with the state. Any questions on these? So let's talk about the the budget and where we are and the changes that we're requesting. So just to let everybody know, at this point in the year, we typically look at what's actually happened budget-wise and we try to true things up. And that's in terms of revenues, that's what we're doing here is we've looked at our rec activity, we've trued that up, that's caused a positive variance, um, which had to do with kind of how we had forecast that. Um, when we did the budget projections last fall. In terms of uh, other increases in revenues, we have greater than expected um, utility remittances uh, and our Reggie auction prices, the clearing prices have been higher than we had forecast. So our revenue forecast for the year is going to increase by 1.1 million. In terms of expenses, uh, don't worry, we're not going to run out and spend it all. Um, we are seeking an overall increase of 154,000. Um, the majority of this comes from increased program administration costs, primarily related to increased volume on the um, incentive program side. That has to do with the need to do more inspections if we're doing more smarty installations and more RCIP installations. It's a volumetric number. We'd like to hit certain percentages. And if you're doing more, you're gonna do more. Um, there also is a backlog of RCIP projects that we need to close out. We have some consulting uh, resources who are um, here, to, who we have lined up that we, would like to help us clear that because that's as we are reaching the program uh, limits and as we have the RCIP extension, this is just something that needs to get taken care of and we need to get these closed out. Um, and then we have had some additional expenses around supporting the smooth and orderly transition of the RCIP. So moving away from the incentive to a tariff, we've uh, been providing a lot of time and staff support and. Um, we've relied on some consulting, some consultants um, to assist us with this work with Pura. So uh, we have additional expenses there. Um, we have some other things that we're tweaking and cutting in the budget in terms of some technology development that we just don't think we're going to be able to accomplish this year. Um, in terms, uh, and we also have a couple of minor reallocations that um, basically offset each other, but um, having to do with uh, expenses around the move and um, 
certain thing increasing the furniture or decreasing the furniture budget and increasing the build out budget by the same amount and it, um, due to how we amortize that i think it it nets to a negligible number but i'll flag it here um, in terms of how we're doing expenses what well, expense wise budget to actual um, the big items to note compensation and benefits were running under budget um, basically because we have an operationalized merit um, last year we had a bumper year and we would love to recognize staff for that um, thus far due to the economic situation and everything else that's going on we haven't felt that the timing um, is really right for that and so we're going to continue to um, figure out how how and when we would operationalize that and we'll continue to provide updates to the budget operations and compensation committee um, when they next meet in april regarding that um, marketing we're running under budget but we have our big campaigns launching um i say it said january but i think we actually launched the brand campaign february 2nd and then we have our bond sale campaign which will kick off in april and then finally battery storage expenses um, we're always slated to come in in the second half of the year and we will start um, expending more against that budget as we start um, preparing programs and which brian can speak to later any questions or concerns or on any of this Um, Eric, it's Lonnie. I just just remind me who does the inspections. I mean, I know there are town inspections, right? And so there are there are town inspections in terms of permitting, but the, we do some quality control permitting, uh, the, especially around new installers, uh, just to make sure that things are done according to specs. That uh, what they they said they installed X panel, they actually did install that panel. Um, then it, this is something that we have been working to wean ourselves, wean the market away from the need to have this. Um, but it's um, it's something that at this point we still feel is necessary, but we'll continue to try to um, decrease as we move forward. Thanks. I mean, I know early on. Because we used to hear about it in committee, where the towns felt overwhelmed by inspecting this stuff because their folks didn't understand. <laughs> so um, it sounds like we've mm -hmm. sophisticated. Yeah, Chair, so, yeah, one, one yeah. of the things I've been working on over the years has been um, uh, <coughs> more trainings of local building inspectors through our Sunshot grants through the DOE. So we've probably ameliorated some of it um uh but you know it all depends on the volume that's coming through various towns we, we may be running campaigns we may be some solar contractors may be targeting certain areas so uh, and solar is growing or, or was you know pre-pandemic um so they may have been feeling some of that pressure this, this is tom i've got a couple of questions if i might sure is that okay absolutely yeah thanks thank you thank you for the um for the update a, a few questions when i look at the budget overall changes that you've outlined on on slide 10 um is this a full year look so you expect that when we look at this at the end of the year we're going to have uh increased revenues from where we stand now of a million one and increased expenses of 154,000. is that how i should interpret this that is correct so um, when I look down below on the expenses budget to actual on the battery storage, I think earlier in your commentary you said that that um, our work on the battery stuff was was going slower. Should we expect that the battery storage expenses come in less than budget for the year? Um, I I think it will probably best guess is it probably will come in less than that knowing us and knowing my understanding of where things are and just if we had budgeted to say hey we're we intend to have a platform up by january 1st in the budget and you know it, it's past that we don't have that 
um, that's clearly going to be less. Are we going to spend a big chunk of that money or the majority of that money getting something up the rest of this fiscal year so that we can stand up a program? Yeah, we could. I don't know how much under, um, but I would imagine that it will come in somewhat under that expense. But yeah, you would think if the volume is done, it would, right? Is is what I'm thinking. Right. So like I when we did the original budget, we had the intention that we would have a program that was launching in January, but we don't. So we did have incurred expenses in terms of working with consultants, um in um uh, kind of doing the prep work that we have this far and there's additional prep work and I think that's probably much more than we had initially imagined. So I I'm not I don't want to commit to saying, hey, we're not going to spend 50% of it because it's 50% of the year. It's that, you know what, we'd originally expected to expend a bunch of that on technology and actually operating the program where I think we're going to end up spending more of that on program preparation and development. Right. Well, let, look, let me, certainly in the, go ahead. I'm sorry, Tom, Tom, this is Brian. Let me give a little not bit a more, let, let me give a little bit more flavor. We're going to give more when we do the battery storage update, but per our comprehensive plan, we set a 50 megawatt, uh, or we had put in a proposal to Pura, the public utilities regulatory authority to administer a 50 megawatt battery storage incentive program. Uh, and within our comp plan, as Eric laid out before, uh, we thought we were going to begin administering a program, you know, this January. Um, what's happened is recently Pura came out with a straw proposal that acknowledges the Green Bank as an administrator of a battery storage program with the utilities, but increased the target an order of magnitude. So, so it's 580 megawatts. So it's causing us to go back and be like, okay, we need to take a look at now how we thought about the program design because now we have to, to do a 10 times larger program. So, so we're going to need right. some resources to kind of dig in as you know the next coming three months will be in a regulatory process which will be very technical um but uh all of that's positive we'll give you more details when we get to that agenda item but we're what eric is saying is where we're trying to to manage our expenses as best we can in this opportunistic time where there's a potential huge market that we're going to be helping enable yeah no i i appreciate that what i'm trying to as i look at these three slides together i i'm trying to get in my own mind, kind of the the fifty thousand foot. Uh, are we doing well, or, or are we not doing well here from a financial basis? Right. I look at kind of the the first two slides, and and what I see, and I could be wrong, is that we're doing less projects, and they're costing the the investment is higher on those projects, and those could be the macroeconomic conditions or or what have you. That's that is kind of what I see. Maybe that's a wrong interpretation. And then I see we have, you know, an increase in revenue, which is great. So congratulations on that. Um, we do have an increase in expense. I, I, you've laid out here a few things. There's there's no numbers associated with why. And implicit in that discussion of an increase in expense is also the fact that kind of an offset is is borne by the back of the, the employees by the fact that you, you've delayed your merit increases as well as your your um, hiring. Now, I'm not critiquing those those um, decisions, and I understand that. I'm just trying to get a sense of how should I feel about this. Um, are, are we are you guys happy with what's going on with the programs and they're costing more money? Are we satisfied with the million in revenue? Um, you know. With, uh, tell me how globally what I should take away. What's the takeaway here from your perspective? So I think from, from going back to the targets perspective, I think we, the original targets were here's, a, here's our best case was the low end or our best guess. So it was the low end of these targets that, you know what, this is all, this is what I think that, you know what, we're going to do and from the most part what we're saying here is we're going to surpass that and so we're we're doing better than uh, we had feared uh in terms of deployment and if you look across the tar targets we're for the most part i think we're going to 
significantly surpass that lower end target in terms of capacity installed, especially on in the incentive programs. So we're actually going to get more done. Um, it may be fewer projects, but we're going to get more capacity. Um, yeah, I saw that, that. I agree. So, so I, I walk away from that kind of positive. I don't think we're doing nearly as well as we would have we would love like to be in an ideal world uh but i think given the the economic situation i think that that's pretty good i think from looking at in terms of my reactions to the comments in the budget i think that we um yeah i'm thrilled to have an extra 1.1 million dollars that i wasn't expecting to um and in terms of expenses it's not it's not a significant deviation or significant increase from what we'd initially planned and yeah budget to actual I, I do see your point on the employees and that is something that we would like to take care of and we we will figure out a way to address in terms of compensation and hiring um i mean we, when i when i yeah when i look back i i understand what you're saying but tell me how i should view the fact that Okay, we're surpassing our our low end tar our our you thought it was an aggressive target on on the low end. Okay, I understand what you're saying. We're increasing capacity um, about where we wanted or more. I get that. Um, is it costing us more funds? You know, we're listing it here as investment. We're saying the investment. You know, my takeaway is the investment is is higher. Is that is that a fair takeaway on that or no? I mean, what, ultimately what we're talking about is our acquisition cost per project. It's not, it's not the investment amount. Um, it's the, what are we spending to bring these projects on board? From, a, from an incentive program's perspective, I, th no, I don't think it's costing us more per project to do that than we had initially planned this year than it did previously. Um, I think, yeah, if you look back to last year, yeah, we're going to have more of an expense per project because we're carrying the overhead of running each of these programs. So just administer, it's not that we're spending necessarily more to bring in an additional house to put solar on the roof, but we still have the same overhead to manage that program, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I'm... Fixed I'm cost. trying to foresee what it means. Yeah, I'm trying to foresee what it means for the future, so, right? I'm looking at this, right. you know, and what does it do for our 2022 budget? Are our admin costs going up per project or, as you said, per program? You know, are we going to get squeezed here? Um, who knows what's going to happen with the economy, particularly on a commercial real estate around? I'm just trying to, like I said, so, it's giving me the data, but it's not giving me the conclusion. Like, how do I interpret it? That's what so, I'm trying to get to. So, to that point, if you, I think that incentive programs, we have to see what the what the future of the RCIP is um, in terms of where we, how close we are to hitting that statutory target. We do have that RCIP extension buffer, um, and so. I, I don't think we will see increased per project administrative costs change from that if things are extended. If that um, if the project does hit its target and starts to fade away, then obviously the expenses of maintaining that program will decrease for the organization. On the financing program side, um, in terms of what we're paying per acquisition, especially on the PPA uh, and our new map, the marketplace assistance program offering. Um, I think that, that that's a relatively fixed cost. We may be spending more to bring some of those projects in, but I, our costs are pretty much fixed in terms of, we're not adding staff for that program. We're not, um, we don't have significant new initiatives that, we're, that are, are increasing those expenses. So I think that, um, if we, that said, MAP is volumetric, and if we do have a larger, the more that we spend there, we could end up with a larger pipeline that will attribute to a larger balance sheet. But that is a smaller percentage of expenses and a smaller percentage of those 
fixed costs, or I'm sorry, smaller portion of his administrative costs for the programs. Right. Right. Yeah, and, I don't want and, to. Um, this I, is Mac. Go ahead. I'll just add real quick on on that point. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think the magnitude on the financing program side w with solar is just at a different scale than we've done in any other year. Uh, Eric, if you'll go back to the the financing programs, um, the the most we've ever done in a single year was was 14 megawatts that across all the programs, and and that was an outlier. Typically, we're well below. 10. Um, and I think that that approach reflects our uh, just reliance on, on contractors for customer acquisition. MAP is the first time we've gone out and uh, really proactively directly acquired customers uh, and developed projects. And, you know, it's led to a, what should be a doubling of what we do on average. Um, there is a, a and uh, you know, there is a, a customer acquisition cost there that we just typically haven't borne. But again, I think you know we're getting it's well justified because it's you know it's completely paid for itself several times over uh, with the uh, with the increased deployment. Um, and those expenses typically hit. You know, these projects take a, a year or so to develop. So a lot of those are spread out. You know, we're, you know essentially we're paying now for the projects we'll see in in 2021. I yeah I get all that, um, but that's kind of a known. That's yeah that's kind of a known. When we put together the budget, we and we do these things, we kind of know the way this goes. So you would think mm -hmm. that's in the budget, you know, and and budgeted in that way. And I'm sure it is. And again, yeah. guys, I'm not trying to be critical. What I'm trying to do is get a context for how I should view about this. You're throwing a lot of data points at us. You, I, I'll speak for myself. Right, you're throwing a lot of data points at us. You're saying, "Hey, this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened." I'm not hearing the um, the, the kind of the the story behind the words or the story behind the numbers saying uh, we're on track, we're good, we're controlling things, or we screwed this up. Which, hey, that happens. Um, we we need to be diligent on this. We need to watch our our margins on this. Um, we're controlling expenses like this. It, it's coming across to me is pretty reactive as opposed to proactive and saying, what does this mean for us for the future? And it just might be the way I'm hearing the presentation as opposed to the what you're trying to convey. So please let me, you know, it, again, it's not a criticism. I'm just trying to get beneath the numbers and say, are we doing good or do we got some issues here? That's what I'm trying to get to. So, uh, this, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Eric, this is uh, Celia Price. Do you want me to weigh in a little bit on the incentive programs? I, I mean, you can say, I think just to to directly answer Tom's question, I I am much more confident in terms of proceeding against the targets than I was earlier in the year. I think we all are in terms of staff. In terms of our cost to deploy stuff, I think that, Short term costs are going up, but I don't see that as being a longer term trend. Um, and in terms of managing resources, I think we've done pretty well, and I'm I'm pretty confident in the, in what we've planned and what our ability to execute against that. Um, and uh, so, I mean, if you want to add some color on the incentive programs, feel free. But Tom, I I don't know if that was direct enough for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. This is there... Does anybody else have any questions? Related to this? So success costs money, I guess that's what we're saying. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I mean, you think which, about typical the way, volumetrics. These are unique, individualistic projects. So I think you, you kind of have to factor that in too when you start looking at the deployment process. It's not one I, size. I couldn't all. agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more that success costs money. What I'm trying to know and understand is: Are we planning for that accordingly, and we do we know what that means? That's all. No, no, you know? that was good input, and I think you know one thing that. Um, our, our team is really good at is doing these kinds of analytics. So 
um, you know, reviewing. And, and so um, I'm sure going forward, that's going to happen. Great. Okay, so um, resolution two, progress to targets. Um, I, do I hear a motion to approve? Do, do we have any more questions or concerns? So do I hear a motion to approve? Uh, Lonnie, this is John Harrity. And uh, uh, as chair of the uh, committee, I would uh, make a motion to approve uh, resolution two. Thank you, John. Um, any seconds? Binu Chandy, second. Thank you, Binu. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, moving on. Um, there's um, so a, a new a, another part of this discussion actually is um, revisions to the comprehensive plan, and uh, and and also um, involving I think the Green Liberty Bonds. Um, uh -huh. So we're going to, Brian, is that uh, you? Uh, that is me. Uh, thank you, Chair Reed. Um, yeah, so we are um, proposing some revisions to our comprehensive plan. Um, so, you know, our comprehensive plan for FY 2020 and beyond is called uh, Green Bonds Us. Uh, green, the environment bonds us, it unites us or brings us together. Uh, of course, green bonds us also has a financial uh, connotation to it, which is tied to the green liberty bonds, green bonds, and, and we sell them across the country, U.S. Uh, but uh, so, so we have a double naming for our comp plan that, that is humanity-based and finance-based. Um, so green bonds us is implied in, in so much of our strategic direction, uh, including our uh, current vision statement, uh, a world empowered by the renewable energy of community. Uh, our current goals uh, to strengthen Connecticut's communities by making the benefits of the green economy inclusive and accessible to all individuals, families, and businesses, and I emphasize inclusive and all, uh, the, the creation of inclusive prosperity capital, you know, so to maintain and build our commitment to underserved communities that we nearly lost uh, from the sweep several years ago. Uh, and just as uh, uh, Chair Reed was alluding to there, our, our citizen green bonds are what we called in our comprehensive plan, mini green bonds, uh, but what we now call green liberty bonds. Uh, so, so this is a picture of, of Walton Jr. Uh, back in uh, June of 2019, uh, we celebrated with the Walton family uh, in the Hartford area Habitat for Humanity. They had been celebrating their 30th anniversary uh, and we were celebrating this event uh, with Eversource uh, Home Energy Technologies, which is an efficiency contractor uh, in Posigen, whom we all know, uh, the unveiling of their zero energy ready home uh, in, in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, and between the super energy efficient home and solar PV on the roof, uh, the energy consumption for the Walton family is almost entirely offset. Um, so, you know, as the event you know, of a couple of weeks ago at our nation's capital on January 6th have shown us, uh, our country is in a very difficult time. Uh, we're having to reckon with uh, structural racism that exists in our society. Uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on people of color, uh, black and Hispanic families has shown that they're, they're more likely to be infected by and die from COVID-19 uh, in comparison to their white neighbors. Uh, issues of environmental justice around the siting of polluting facilities that cause rep respiratory disease and other ailments that result in high rates of asthma and other pulmonary illnesses, uh, again, re resulting in greater adverse impacts from COVID-19. So, so the Connecticut Green Bank, we, we need to be a part of the solution to realizing the promise of our democracy and ensuring that our system of capitalism works for everybody, uh, especially the most vulnerable. Uh, although we're, we're recognized leaders when it comes to solar with justice, uh, ensuring that low to moderate income families and communities of color are demanding solar proportionately more uh, than non-LMI families, uh, we now need to be more explicit uh, about our intention. 
So with that, uh, the staff is proposing the following changes uh, to our comprehensive plan. Uh, the first is uh, built around uh, equity. Uh, this, this JEDI term is, is something that has, it comes to uh, many of our tops of our minds these days, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, but what we can think of these proposed staff changes to the comp plan are really about equity. Uh, the first proposed change is around the vision statement. Uh, you might recall that our current vision statement is uh, a world empowered by the renewable energy of community, uh, which really means what we're saying here, a planet protected by the love of humanity. Um, the environmental challenges that we are dealing with, climate change, uh, environmental justice, requires us really to first and foremost care about each other. And when we do that, we're going to be able to confront those other problems. Uh, so green bonds us, the environment unites us, right? So coming back to that. So, uh, you know, not many people would put love uh, in, in a vision statement, but that is really what it's about. It is about us helping other people and me holding Walton Jr. If we aren't feeling the love of what we do every day and what we're doing in our communities, then, then we're not meeting the promise of the Green Bank. So, so that's the first proposed change is, is really digging into that vision statement. Uh, the second is a de including the definition of vulnerable communities. Uh, the next slide uh, goes specifically into that. So I, I, will, I will talk about that. It, it is statutorily defined now. So uh, what we're proposing is, is sprinkling it throughout the comprehensive plan. Uh, number three uh, is modifying goal number two to call out uh, especially vulnerable communities to make it a point that we want to drive more investment in and ensure more benefits inure to vulnerable communities. Again, we'll come back to that definition in a second. Uh, and then four and five is really where the rubber meets the road, which is, you know, we have Sergio and his team leading the incentive programs. We have Mackie and his team leading the financing programs. Well, we now know how to uh, look at uh, and measure our investment and benefits in uh, investment in clean energy and benefits from it. Uh, so let's put a target out there. No less than 40% of the investment and benefits by 2025 would inure to vulnerable communities. So let's make it a commitment as an organization to continue to uh, build on the progress we've made in that sector and go further. Um, so that's what four and five are saying. Uh, and then the other proposed revisions that you uh, may have seen in the comp plan are just, you know, immaterial. They're, they're just updating certain things, the progress, the targets that Eric just worked through, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, impacts on the sustained orderly development uh, of the residential solar industry. So we included our RCIP ER extension from October, November. Uh, the solarized storage proposal that we're going to talk about in a bit, we've had big progress there on battery storage. Uh, we updated the green liberty bonds language and then various other cleanups uh, throughout uh, the comprehensive plan. Uh, so those are some proposed revisions, but let me just dig in a little bit to vulnerable communities and we can come back to those other proposed changes. So um, this statutory definition actually came about in, from the fall session uh, from Public Act 2005, also colloquially known as the Take Back Our Grid Act which was when the uh, Energy and Technology Committee had to come back into session as a result of uh, the high rates uh, from the summer and the storm response uh, that caused uh, ratepayers uh, uh, significant distress. Uh, so that brought the legislature back to pass this bill. And this definition was included in that bill. Uh, we worked specifically with DEEP uh, on this definition and specifically calling out uh, the underlined and bold section, which I'll talk about why that's important in a second. Uh, but it means, you know, those populations that are disproportionately impacted uh, by the effects of climate, uh, including low to moderate income communities, uh, which, you know, again, we've all had our arms around for quite some time. Uh, environmental justice communities pursuant to an existing statute. Uh, those are communities that are located in and around polluting facilities. Uh, and then this was what we added, uh, communities eligible for CRA. Uh, and why we added this was because one of our principles is to use limited amount of government to mobilize more private investment. And the Community Reinvestment Act is all about enabling uh, FDIC insured state, 
regional, national community banks and credit unions to invest in low to moderate income communities. So we wanted to ensure that this was clearly articulated in the definition of vulnerable communities so that we can continue to work with our private capital partners, Bert and his team, to share with them that the more investment they put into these communities, uh, the better it is uh, that they are supporting uh, the public policy objectives of the state. Um, so uh, important milestone, that vulnerable communities definition passing in statute, and we just wanted to internalize that uh, within the context of our comprehensive plan. So those are uh, those are the proposed uh, changes to the comprehensive plan. Happy to take any questions, comments. Uh, this is uh, John Harity. I, I I really this just um, uh, lifts my heart to uh, see this uh, included um, in uh, the plan, and um, it's the direction that the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs is uh, headed in also that we have been working on this issue um, with a certain amount of ignorance about the um, a particular impact on uh, people of color and, and uh, communities, uh, urban communities in particular. Um, and so I think it's really um, uh, spot on for the Green Bank to um, to highlight this issue and to back that up with targets uh, that reflect that. I, I would just um, add that the other vulnerable people in the time of climate change are um, uh, displaced workers who are displaced from the fossil fuel economy. Also, I mean, often, uh, you know, impacting communities uh, as well. And we haven't seen much of that here. I don't know if we will in Connecticut, but that's another group to keep in mind as we move forward. But I, I really applaud the bank for for, for uh, doing this. Thank you. I second that. This is Brenda um, echoing John's comments in that I, I really appreciate the folks at the Green Bank for taking the time to make these modifications to the plan. Definitely a step in the right direction. This is Lonnie. I also think going forward, as we, as you know, we're we're really creating a much more. In fact, it was, I thought it was uh, remarkable that the the new president spoke about climate change initiatives at the top of his address. Um, you know that that could also position us for you know federal funding and incentives going forward to really have these goals uh, articulated this well. Uh, Lonnie, this is Eric. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good. Oh, good. I've been having some trouble with my microphone here. So I, um, I'm on the phone. So I just want to confirm through all these references to uh, vulnerable communities and so forth. Um, these are all uh, perfectly aligned with uh, current statutory language. In other words, we don't go beyond uh, or broaden the definition or, or be more specific in terms of our definitions beyond what's been adopted in statute. Is that correct? Uh, Eric, this is Brian. That's correct. Um, and I, I think broadly, when you look at uh, the vulnerable communities definition, when it speaks to those populations that have been disproportionately impacted by the, the effects of climate change, that is a catch-all to Yes, not only low to moderate income communities, but also communities of color, because they are they are just for whatever reason, you, you structural racism, they are the ones that are adversely impacted by these things that happen. So but you, um, but you don't prefer, call that out. You don't call that out beyond what's in. So the statute doesn't say that, right? The statute says vulnerable that, communities. It doesn't say communities of color. That's right. That's right. Okay, because my only thing is I don't know of any studies. I mean, obviously, communities of color, at least it seems to me, are impacted um, in large part because of their socioeconomic conditions. 
Um, I don't know, as I think I said on the meeting the other day, um, you know, if, if a family living in Bridgeport close to the highway or close to the uh, coastal impacts of climate change, uh, I, I don't know that, that uh, you know, a, a white person is any more or less susceptible than a person of color. Um, so I, I, I just, uh, and, and, you know, I'm just, I, I'm always very neutral. I'm a big Martin Luther King fan. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like to draw distinctions where we don't know that there are any. And hopefully we're moving in the direction where there are no s distinctions uh, someday. But um, as long as we're keeping ourselves tied to what's in statute, um, I think that's fine. Great. We, and, and we would be here. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Do I hear a motion to approve resolution three? Uh, this is John Herity. I make a motion to approve. And I second. I was waiting for that, Brendan. <laughs> Marvelous. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Marvelous. Uh, resolution three is approved. Okay, moving on to um, investment updates and recommendations. And um, I sure. believe we're moving the Cargill Falls mill sure, yeah. discussion to the end of the agenda. Uh, Chair Reed, for, forgive me. There's um, one more item. Uh, Eric um Schrager was going to provide an overview of asset management uh, something that kevin walsh had requested and we will do a follow-up with him directly but it would be good for the board to hear this before we move into those investments if we could oh wow oh i do see uh, excuse me i do see that i <laughs> uh, excellent we do want to hear that all right thank you so um, i'm trying to remember when this was i think it was about a year ago we were presenting to the board and there were some questions raised on what was going on with asset management, what tools were in place, what personnel was in place. Um, and so I'd like to circle back and kind of give an update of what progress we've made. Um, previously, we had our asset management functions, which is basically the oversight of our investments, um, was spread across the organization. and. To a certain extent, it still is, but we're in the process of consolidating that and um, building process. So we hired Carl Johnson as our assistant for asset management and compliance um, on the first day of the shutdown last year. Um, so we had an interesting start. Um, and Carl's responsible for building asset management processes and tools, um, and he's had a great start so far, um, really lining up various pieces of information, data points, and building some reporting. He's really embedded himself with our PPA team and has spent a lot of time um, getting familiar with those projects and making sure that we have um, the insight into them to make sure that they're performing as expected. On the um, Shrek side, Sarah Pine is transitioning into a new role to focus on the asset management process for the Shrek project. So that's how the projects go from being just a system on which we're paying an incentive to us actually monetizing that renewable energy credit. So in terms of tools and infrastructure, <clears throat> we've gone from a world where everything is manual to <clears throat> building our own um, building our own sets of tools. So we've connected the data sources into our data warehouse um, to track agreements. So we've built up uh, Salesforce to make sure that we're logging each deal that is done, both on the investment side, but also where we're capitalizing ourselves um, so that we can link everything together. We, um, we are currently sourcing payment histories. We have sourced generation forecasts, um, and then we're comparing that to generation performance. So we have one large database uh, that and we're still perfecting and we're getting that up to date. And we've also implemented a system called Flowcast, which helps us track deliverables and is part of our accounting close, but that will help us track everything that we're owed and that we owe outward. 
In terms of process, um, we had on the generation oversight side, so making sure that systems are performing what they expect. We have a regular comparison of forecasts versus actual performance on our solar assets. Um, we have controls implemented to ensure systems versus where um, we have performance guarantees. Uh, in terms of financial performance, we have the same oversight that we previously did, but we have an added layer in terms of uh, now having um, insurance that project level cash flows are what we expected on the PPA projects. Um, and Carl's working on taking on more outside of the PPA as we progress. Um, compliance, we've established a library of compliance deliverables and we're uh, setting up the tracking of those through Flowcast. So this is the type of thing where, hey, due to our credit lines at Webster, we owe them these financials in the first of every month, or hey, uh, this project that um, owes us money should be giving us their quarterly generation numbers to make sure that everything's up and running. Have we received them? Um, in terms of portfolio return, we've built a report that gives us the ability to track returns um, uh, our, on our investments versus what our targets were. So helps us evaluate when making a decision, but also um, allows us to make sure that we are um, generating that income that we had uh, originally forecast. And now we're working on other reporting that, how do we display this payment history? How do we report to the board? Um, so I will be reaching out to some of you to get some input um, in the next month or two. Um, we have some mock-ups, but as we're finishing automating data sources, we want to figure out what you guys want to see in terms of reporting and also take any other advice on other, um, other points that we should be reviewing in terms of asset management. Any questions? Eric, uh, this, this... Go ahead. Sorry, John. This is just a quick comment. This is Brian on top. So, so on top of Eric's other hundred responsibilities that he's been taking on and just doing a great job on, uh, the asset management is a, a very important uh, and ongoing activity that uh, we need to build as an organization. You know, when we uh, restructured ourselves after the sweeps, um, it became very important that we focus in on building our balance sheet that is non-current assets with interest producing revenue sources. So um, in having a conversation with Kevin Walsh uh, over, I think it was the summer of 2019, we talked a bit about this. So uh, this has been uh, an ongoing project. It's gonna continue to be, we collect data. Now it's just a matter of pulling it all together into accessible visuals that will allow us to see the risk, see the reward, kind of see how far off we are in terms of sustainability, where the interest income will cover our OPEX, you know, all those sorts of things. So uh, Eric has been working really hard across the organization to ensure data sources are connecting uh, so that we can begin to start to see some of these insights. So I just wanted to add that that point. Sorry, John. Oh, no, no, not at all. That was important stuff to say. I, I the The only comment I had was that um, this stuff is important, not only like for us to better understand, you know, how we're using our money, how it comes back, uh, how the projects are doing, but then um, like the Connecticut Green Bank is serving as a model and a template for uh, other uh, green banks. And the more we hone this stuff and we're able to share uh, that information with other green banks, they begin at a point much further along than they would have otherwise, and it makes it much more possible for them to succeed. So this, uh, you know, I, my point is that the importance of this goes beyond just what's happening in Connecticut, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great work. That's it, thank you. Thanks, John. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, so now moving on uh, to investment updates and recommendations, and um, we are going to move the Cargill Falls discussion to the end of the agenda. It needs an executive session because there's some proprietary information uh, that needs to be discussed related to our investment. Um, and uh, so, if there's no um, 
proposition, I would like to move that to the uh, end of the agenda. And um, I think also we're going to hear an update. So this is an update from um, on uh, the fuel cell energy in a project in Groton, Connecticut. And I guess that's Bert. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, this, this should be a pretty quick update. Um, it, the board will recall that at its December meeting, uh, we brought forward a request which the board did approve at that meeting uh, for the Green Bank to participate to the extent of um, eight million dollars as part of uh, the capital stack that is shown on the, the left-hand side of, of the slide toward the bottom, uh, in uh, as part of uh, debt debt capital totaling $20 million, uh, which is part of uh, $53 million in, in source capital uh, toward, toward this project, which is complete and is undergoing uh, commissioning exercises right now to bring uh, the two fuel cell modules to full power. Um, we had presented to the board uh, the two lenders, Liberty Bank and Amalgamated Bank, shown there on, on the slide, uh, participating in uh, kind of a um, an une uneven uh, participation. One uh, Liberty Bank would be coming in for a seven-year fully, fully amortizing uh, a piece of senior debt. Uh, we had uh, originally sketched with Amalgamated a, a 14-year fully amortizing uh, piece of, of senior debt. Uh, in talking through the structure subsequent to uh, last month's board meeting, the senior lenders uh, agreed that it would be simpler to come in under a uh, an equal structure, an equal uh, amortization structure, which would have the transaction uh, paying out to a, <clears throat> a small balloon in the uh, of of four million dollars in the seventh year, um, and uh, with the transaction amortizing over a 10, 10 year period. That um, that revised structure has been agreed all around the table um, uh, and is subject only to uh, the the senior lenders completing their uh, diligence on the project, which is underway as we speak, as well as uh, taking it to their respective credit committees. The position of the Green Bank is unaffected uh, by by this, and um, so which is shown there. Uh, in the highlight uh, uh, highlighted row. So uh, with that, this is just to advise the board of the change. It's not changing any of our terms and, and conditions, but I did just did uh, in full disclosure, wanted to bring that to the board's attention and, and address any questions that the board may have at, at this time. Um, there you go. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Bert. It's, any questions or comments? Okay, um, so moving on, financing, let's see, item six, financing programs, updates, and recommendations. I think this also involves um, some direct billing uh, with our CPACE program, which I personally think is a great idea. <laughs> um, and so we're going to hear from um, Mackie um, Dykes, Bert Hunter, and I think for the first time we're having a presentation from Catherine Duncan, who's the senior loan administrator with uh, the Green Bank. So welcome, everybody. Great. Thank you, Chair Reed. This is Mackie Dykes. Um, yeah, I'm, as, uh, as the chair said, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Duncan. Uh, for those that don't know her, she plays many roles within the Green Bank. Uh, one of those includes managing our CPACE billing and collection process with uh, all our participating municipalities. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about this proposed change to, to that system. Thank you, Mackie. Uh, okay, so the program is looking to make an operational change around the billion and collection, and this change will require board approval. So uh, the statute states that CPACE benefits will be paid in the same manner as property taxes. And at the inception of the CPACE program, the Green Bank decided that municipal billing and collection would make the program more attractive. 
This was implemented by establishing legal agreements with participating municipalities, making the towns responsible for the billing and collection of all, rescheduled, of all scheduled payments. Challenges have arisen over the last eight years with both billing and collection as the number of assessments serviced by the municipalities has grown. So staff is requesting to shift the responsibility from this billing and collection uh, for rather the billing and collection from the municipalities to the Green Bank. Now the way billing currently works is the Green Bank shares payment information with the municipalities and the municipalities load information into a system that then generates and mails bills on the property tax cycle. In, for instance, the July 2020 collection cycle, we had 90 tax collectors with 90 different versions of hardware and software generating about 300 bills on 90 different printers with unsurprisingly widely differing results. And while most bills are correct, incorrect bills are sent and bills can be sent late. The Green Bank won't know there's a problem for six or more weeks when towns begin to confirm payments and unexpected amounts are received or possibly a new loan doesn't make a first payment. When we look into it, we may find the bill didn't go, the bill went incorrectly, or there'll be some other billing issue. Then on the collection side, currently the payments move from the property owners to the tax collectors to the municipal accounts payable departments, then to the green bank, and finally to the lien holders. On-time payments can be made or postmarked by the first business day of the month after the month the bill was issued. So essentially, there's about a 32-day payment period, depending upon where the end of a month falls in terms of weekends. Some towns generate reports on these payments and remit to the Green Bank promptly. More towns generate reports on payments and remit to the uh, Green Bank several weeks after the collection period has ended. And then there are towns that require additional and continuous Green Bank outreach for both the information about the payments and the funds transfers sometimes into the fourth and fifth months after an on-time payment was made. So third-party capital providers find this lack of insight into what borrowers were actually billed, what they paid, when they paid, and when the municipality will transfer funds to the Green Bank's collection account. And the information black hole creates serious frustration with our program. Our solution is to take over the billing and collection. And we are calling it administrator billing. So we propose to shift responsibility entirely to the green. We'd undertake this with support from an experienced loan servicer. We have all the billing data. It all originates from us. And then we would use a single servicer uh, to generate consistent and accurate billing, all issued at the same time. The Green Bank would implement, we could implement a proofing process. If we have one person generating all those bills, we can control that easily and, and implement a proofing process before bills are mailed. And we can provide investors with electronic copies of every bill so they'll know what went out to their, to their property owners. Property owners would remit the funds directly to the Green Bank's CPAYS collection account, bypassing the municipality entirely. Under the proposed structure, all funds would be received directly by us during the collection period and transferred to the investors within five business days of receipt. So in just over one month, the cycle will be essentially complete and both funds and information will be readily available to all lien holders. In addition to eliminating the frustration, the errors and the delays, the shift will save the program money. Currently, we pay every active municipality $500 a year to bill and collect funds. If we take on the job, that will be eliminated and we will save $45,000 a year. 
Now, pricing indications from our current loan servicer suggests that they will increase our fees by a mere $5,000 annually. And this is because they anticipate such a time saving after the project, after the setup process. So in exchange for moving to having one biller and one collection process, they'll save, they think, four months of effort. And thereby the charge really relates to producing bills and mailing them, stamps. So we won't incur a lot of money for saving that $45,000. We'll also save a $4,690 fee that we pay annually to the tax collector's software provider, which is for annual support, as well as $1,000 every time a, a new town gets set up on a CPA software module. So if someone could move to the next slide. Oh, that is the next slide, sorry. Benefits. So um, all stakeholder benefits, um, all the stakeholders benefit from the shift to administrator billing. The municipalities are relieved of a task that they do not welcome. Property owners will receive accurate, timely bills with multiple payment options available beyond merely paying by check, which is what the municipalities um, limit them to. Our capital providers will have quick access to funds and information, as well as reliable billing and a seriously shortened collection cycle. And the Green Bank saves time and money while enhancing the program for everybody. So implementation, if approved, we would like to implement this for the July 2021 billing cycle. And we'll collaborate with the lien holders and the municipalities and the loan servicer to ensure a smooth handover. And to uh, move ahead with this, we would need the program guidelines, which we have updated, to reflect this shift. And that's what we're requesting be approved today so that we can move ahead. Are there any questions? Uh, this, this is Matt. I, I have four questions. I'll put them all out there and uh, you can respond if you like. Um, mm -hmm. I, just, I just want to make sure that this statutory language doesn't require us to go through the municipality and and two similarly uh, I just want to know if, if we've reviewed our benefit assessment liens that we record for each uh, benefit assessment whether that contains language about the bill originating from the municipality and then three uh, you know have you considered whether this would have any impact on our collection rate I for example if someone sees something come from coming from the tax assessor as opposed to a private biller would they be more likely to pay it because we and then for um, will has anyone looked just to see if this will create any weakness or new challenge to our ability to foreclose on those liens like you know will it create a, a defense if we've changed the billing method in a way that's not uh, set out in the lien itself. Okay, um, what I can tell you about these four topics, and Brian Farnan may, or Mackey may chime in, um, the statutory language, we, we did have outside counsel review and assure us that they thought we were within our legal, you know, that, that this would be okay. This is yeah. our right for us yeah, to do. Yeah, this is Brian. We, we did look at that particular issue because we were originally envisioning whether or not we need to make a statutory change to make this happen. And, you know, after kind of a back and forth with outside counsel, we felt comfortable that we did not need a statutory change to allow for this type of billing in, in towns right now outsource their billing. Um, yes, you know, if, if there's quarterly payments in a municipality, we should maintain with that payment approach or if there's, you know, biannual. Um, so we'll still follow the same process and as the towns do. Um, I feel like we're on solid ground in that sense. I can also look at our CPACE benefit assessment liens to see if it, if any of the language is a problem. That's a good point. Um, and on the issue of whether or not this hinders our right to for the senior lien position, I mean, 
someone could always argue that. I'm not going to say, you know, someone could always argue that, you know, this is different from a municipal lien. It's not, you know, so I, I don't, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with that first question of whether or not we have the ability to do it, just like a municipality has the ability to outsource um, some of their uh, payment process. Um, but I think we'd be okay there, but I will look at the fee based benefit assessment lien. Mac, you or Alex, if you're on, if you want to add anything, feel free. Yeah, so well, this Brian, is, uh, I'll add uh, to get the good call out on the BAL. Uh, I, I don't think we reviewed that document. Uh, to, we to have, Mac. I don't think it. Okay. Well, I, I know we have, we have agreed the administration, reviewed the administration agreements that we have with all our third party capital providers on each project, as well as our financing agreements. Uh, and everything's in line, uh, or everything, those, both, both those agreements would, would allow this, this shift. Um, as to the impact on collection rate, uh, I mean, yeah, that's the, <laughs> uh, that when, when, you know, we, we set up the fee base program, that was, you know, what, the primary reason we had the, the towns do it, that was the thinking that it's, uh, going to add security, uh, to the, um, to the, to the repayments. Um, so that was the first thing we looked at when we, uh, when we thought about making this, this change. Um, so we, we sounded out capital providers to see what, you know, uh, what their feelings were on this. And, you know, I, there amongst them, there, there didn't seem to be any worry on, uh, on that aspect of it. And any worries they did have was far outweighed by the benefits that, that Catherine alluded to. I mean, we had one primary cap, we had one capital provider who has, uh, the largest seat-based project in Connecticut who said they would never do another project here uh, because of the frustrations they've experienced with, with billing, which has led to uh, issues with making bond repayments on, uh, on, the, on their, the project that they have. The, the other thing we looked at was there are a few other states or seat-based programs that don't have the municipalities or whoever the property taxing entity uh is in the in that state do the billing and collection so we looked at uh whether in cpa securitizations that included states that did have the the property taxing entity do the billing and collection uh whether those were treated differently and from a rating standpoint uh then uh be assessments in in programs that that had some other uh, entity doing it and there's no difference uh that that's been you know assigned uh to to the differences in, in billing and collection in terms of you know again the you know how the the rating agencies look at uh the the different bals so you know with, with those two data points and uh uh going back you know the, the <laughs> to the, all all the benefits that uh, we you know we we're, we'll, we're definitely going to do this in close coordination with the capital providers. We've we've sounded them out on this, and you know we received some questions, uh, uh, and others were, were they, they didn't have questions. They just said yes, you know you, you need to do this. Um, but we will you know we wanted to come to the board first uh, before we started the formal process of outreach to them, you know to make sure that they're they're fully on board. Uh, but we would do this in close coordination with them to make sure that, you know, if if somehow that that feeling does emerge uh, amongst all of them uh, and, and start to come out and, and they you know they oppose this, then you know we'll stop. I mean, this is <laughs> this is a shift to to serve them uh, as our our primary customers for the program. So you know we would let them them dictate, uh, you know, if if those worries all of a sudden do start outweighing the the benefits. And just on the benefit assessment liens, none of the lien language, none of those documents in, refer to billing and collection at all. It's really only covered in the Muni agreement. Which makes complete sense. As I'm kind of trying to get the documents up and that, that intuitively makes sense. Okay, thanks. Any more questions or comments? <clears throat> this is Tom. Uh, one of the comments that I would have, or, or I, I hesitate to say it's a concern, 
But I do think a shift of this type could be very confusing. And I would pay particular attention to the transition plan. Uh, I can foresee certainly dealing with all the municipalities we're dealing with that there could be double billing uh, if the municipality does not take it off their bills uh, on a timely basis, and we do. I think there'll be confusion if not communicated properly to the ultimate payer, the, the owner of the properties, as to they used to get this bill from the town, now they're getting it from the, the Green Bank. Um, so I think there could be unintended consequences, at least in the short to mid term. I would also um, just make sure as regards the contract with your provider who's going to do this billing um, is, is rock solid uh, because I could foresee a situation and have seen it in my own professional career where you convert over uh, the amount of work is more than that provider had anticipated and they come back to kind of recut the deal. Um, so I think all those things need to be considered and, and truthfully the, the devil's going to be in the details on the transition and administration of this because the presentation was well thought out. I appreciate you addressing the cost. Um, I think uh, the other benefit here is obviously getting the funds in the door much more quickly, um, but I think you need to pay attention to the details here because I don't think it's going to go that smooth uh, in the near term. So, um, Tom, this is Catherine. We have considered many of those points. Those are very valid points. Um, the contract with the provider and the, and them raising the rates, I don't know that we'll be able to add anything like that into the agreement we have with them. We can try, but they have assured me that their perception is that for at least the first three years, we could even ask them for a price reduction if we are able to convert many of the property owners to direct debits. So, um, that contracting process will begin, I would imagine, sometime in March so that we have a lot of time to review and work out those details. The double billing issue, um, I, I would be surprised if that happens. And the reason is that the CPACE bills are issued separately from property tax bills. They're not a line item on the bill. And the tax collectors have to print them themselves. Currently, most tax collectors have their property tax bills printed by the software provider, and they have to separately on their own remember to go in and input a different billing code and generate CPACE bills and then mail them, and that is one of the ongoing problems when they forget. So um, we will have to get um, a release from the municipalities and when that happens the tax collectors will be profoundly aware that it's going on so i'm not as concerned about double billing i am concerned about your your other point which is the property owners because i do think that and i've explored it with two of our lien holders so far how the communication needs to be handled so they don't they're being scammed that was my biggest worry if somebody sent me something that said stop paying the town and start paying the green bank um, I wouldn't trust it and so we were planning on multiple communications probably with the lien holder being the initial communicator um, but we will be working that out carefully and expect that we'll start communicating in April. This is Lonnie. Um, as I recall, since we have implemented uh, CPACE, the municipalities have looked for more and more guidance. <laughs> and uh, the current program um, was instituted after the initial um, implementation to you know, to clarify and codify and all of that. So it's been an ongoing evolution. Um, I'm wondering, I see in the resolution that we're approving it um, unless the public comments bring in significant um, proposals for change. And I'm just wondering if we should, um, you know, have you come back to us after everything you, you learn just to make sure, I don't know how everybody feels about this, but I'm just wondering if, Perhaps you should come back to us and um, and let us Lonnie, know. Lonnie, this so is we Brad. I think a report back on any public comments, even if they're um, minor, is not a bad idea. Even 
but we'd be happy to do that. And maybe hopefully we can do it in a way that doesn't require a second resolution, but we should at least report back. And if there are bigger things, then obviously yes, then we would bring them with a new resolution. But that, that that's not a we can do that. Okay, that sounds good. Does, it, does everybody agree with that? Yes. yes. Okay. So, do I hear a motion to approve um, resolution number five? The see page changes. To Brenda, I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Brenda. A second. Second. Tom. Oh, Tom. Oh, good. Oh, that's a good sign. Good, Tom. Um, all in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Resolution 5 is approved. Um, now I think we have another CPACE um, uh, restructuring recommendation for the Meriden project. And um, Mackie, is, um, are you going to tell us about that? I'm actually going to turn it over to Nick Zuba to provide the background on this. Okay, welcome, Nick. Great, thank you so much, Mackie. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to the entire board. So yes, today um, we're coming to you with a request um, to request another uh, restructuring uh, for the Marinette Enterprise Center CPACE project, in which case this was a two-phase project that first involved an energy efficiency improvements, and then a later another solar uh, phase that was added on top of that. And so, you know, we, uh, with the authority that the uh, staff was Ill Ill allowed to get um, in, in basically in a, uh, the, the arrangements that was approved by the board in April of 2020, we exercised that authority at the staff level to give a first six month deferral um, to the Meriden Enterprise Center back um, in June of 2020, uh, we had approved that. So that basically deferred their CPACE payments um, um, in July of 2020 to then maybe resume in January of 2021. But given that they still have some financial hardship, in which I'll go into a second, why you know that is and you know, what they're dealing with, they have come to us with a subsequent request for um, to, to do another deferral. In which case, we were comfortable to want to give them then a full year uh, deferment, so that it would then extend from July 2020 until July of 2021. Um, so that would then be the deferment that they would see, and then basically we would extend their repayment term. Um, out to 22 years um, from uh, to, to basically then to 23 years. Um, in the original term, um, even before we did any deferment, uh, it was 20 years. So just know that that's how far out now the term has gone uh, with these subsequent deferral requests. Um, thereafter, starting in July 2021, we would then have them begin up doing uh, repayments uh, to be at the tune of the $43,000 for the July and then October 2021 payments. So that it gets them back up going again um, to make a payment, but it's not back up to the normal level of repayment that they had originally been making prior to the deferrals we had granted. And then after that, um, starting in January 2022, we would have them then resume a near to normal payment that they were making prior to the deferrals, and then it would settle out to be nearly $65,000 for each repayment period. Um, so that is the offer that we had put in front of the property owner. They agreed to those terms and they were comfortable to accept uh, that option. Now, again, the reason why they came to us again um, for a subsequent deferral request was because they are still dealing with financial hardships um, due to COVID-19. Um, they have been um, generous to their tenants by offering uh, rent uh, relief um, so that their tenants could still stay afloat and that they could get through much of the economic downturn associated with the COVID crisis. And so they have still been continuing to provide that relief um, at this time. So they're really not seeing much in terms of uh, rental income coming into them as the landlord. Um, but at the same time, you know, they are making efforts to try and re raise the amount of revenue that their property is getting by working with their real estate partners uh, of Colliers, um, who they're trying to, to work to get more tenants into the building to increase uh, their rental income. And then at the same time, they're also working on efforts to try and reduce operating costs uh, within their building as well. Um, and trying to, again, you know, um, trying to do that on both sides of the ledger in this case, um, so that they can still remain uh, financially sustainable during the course of the crisis. So um, so that basically is, is the request um, because given the staff uh, level authority has been exhausted and uh, in terms of offering up to a six month deferral previously. Um, so basically now seeking to extend it out to a full year um, that is why certainly we had to come to the board today um, for your review and approval. 
So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Otherwise, um, I will return the floor to uh, the Madam Chair. Thank you. Questions or comments? Yeah, this is Tom. I have a, a question. It's more of a global question on this. So I see that this project, um, the reason for the refinance and the extension here is because the, the building is under certain distress, financial distress, as listed in the documents by COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> My suspicion is a lot of our commercial properties are going to have similar issues. And I'm wondering what's going on um, with many of our projects in this, and if we're getting similar requests that are just not as acute right now, and whether by approving this, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, um, we'll be sending that message that they should come back to us uh, and ask for some some relief right now. Yeah, Tom, that, that's an excellent question. So yeah, um, basically at this point, um, you know, we've only been just getting, you know, the first time requests that we had received in 2020. And that in this case was probably something on the order of about, you know, eight to 10 uh, property owners um, came to us with direct requests for CPA payment deferrals. Um, nobody other than Meriden Enterprise Center to this point has come to us for a secondary deferral. They have been the one and sole only ones to come to us requesting a second one after we granted um, the first one in 2020. Um, so, I mean, as far as I'm concerned at this point, I mean, you know, we have not seen um, even any new uh, requests coming in for any first time deferrals. Um, so other than the ones who came to us in 2020. Um, and, you know, we, we continue to keep our eyes and ears open at this point. But yeah, I mean, I think we, we're guarded and we, we, we recognize that this could be um, you know, we could get other property owners coming to us for these very requests. And, you know, bottom line is that we do stand ready, you know, to um, review any of those requests on a one one on one basis, um, because we do have a diligence process set up um, to consider it. You know, it's not automatic that we would give these uh, deferral requests and grant them. It does have to go through certainly a, a check of all different types of uh, variables in this case to be able to grant that to them. So um, but at this point, you know, we we're taking them as they come in. Uh, but, you know, still, even with this January repayment period, um, so far, just it's been Meriden Enterprise Center has been the sole property owner who came to us. And this is Thank Matthew. you for the, uh, that answer. Oh, go ahead. Uh, and go ahead also, it's Sorry. probably worth pointing out, there is, a, I guess you could call it, there's universal uh, relief in the sense that, uh, similar to what the governor did in July, for the July um, 2020 property taxes, uh, he issued an executive order affecting uh, January 2021 property taxes, which uh, provide relief uh, for property taxes and CPACE is, falls under that. Uh, so building owners have either three months, uh, de depending on what their town decides, they either have three months uh, such a deferral of property taxes and CPACE payments or a uh, significantly reduced late fee uh, for three months. Yeah, so it, thank you for that, Maggie. That's good. That's good insight. Um, quick, a, a quick thought on this, all right? Um, sometimes when you get into a situation like this with, a, a, again, I'll fall back on my private company experience with customers, it's, it's better to be proactive and actually establish a set of standards of things you are willing to do or not to do, as opposed to, I, I agree you need to take each case in terms of whether they qualify or not one by one, but you might wanna consider uh, putting together standard packages um, that you may or may not uh, offer if, if, a, if a property or an investment qualifies, as opposed to doing it one by one. It takes a lot of staff time to do it that way. Um, and you also get into a situation where, and certainly because this is public, um, other customers are gonna be looking for exactly what this one got, what that one got, what have you. Um, I hope it doesn't come to that. And I hope I'm overstating the concern related to these properties having financial issues. Um, but I don't know that that's the case. And I just think a little bit of Kind of planning and proactivity of putting together what we will and what we will not do um, really will help you in those discussions and negotiations uh, as opposed to just putting you out there. 
just a thought for your consideration. Yeah, I, I think I appreciate the feedback. Um, we probably, I mean, this would be, you know, as uh, as Nick indicated, it is the first deferral for a year. Um, we, you know, we do have a a standard set of uh, extensions or a standard set of offers in terms of how the extensions are done, uh, at least for when we dealt with Good. the six month deferral. But we do not. Now that we're you know faced with now looking beyond six month deferrals, uh, we we don't have a standard as to you know whether we'll just do the you know we'll, we'll do year deferrals or, or or what. So that the point taken and uh, you know we'll we'll think about that and should we have any others uh, when we come back to the back to you for approval of those you know sort of provide additional color and 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 how we've thought of thought about establishing those. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah th this is Matt. Yeah, I, I agree with those comments. I mean, I just worry that this isn't going to be the only one, especially when the owner of this site talks to owners of other sites, for example, you know, uh, exactly. they make the same relief. So I guess, I guess that just to see if, you know, if we got more of these, how would that, you know, sort of a stress test or of how that would Im impact us. Um, and our ability to say yes to others under similar terms. And then two, I guess my only other question is in sort of our, you know, being good stewards of, of the people's money. Is this, do you, I know banks are uh, ask for a lot of relief too. Is this, would you say within the realm of what other lenders are willing to do in terms of, uh, you know, people who are struggling to pe repay their commercial loans with, with other institutions? So this is Mackie. I, I would I would say it is. Um, we are. I mean, we're not we're not doing it for free, right? I mean, we're we're extending term, but we're you know we're not waiving interest or anything. We're charging interest for the you know for the deferred period. So you know we will you know we'll, we'll receive more overall in interest uh, income from these restructured loans than we would have otherwise. So. Um, you know, we're not, so yeah, so we're, we're, yeah. So I think because of that, we're, we're in line with, uh, with how, uh, private lenders are, are approaching these restructurings. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, in terms of also what we we've, we've seen in the market, Matt, on this is next. So what we've seen also have heard about in the market is that, you know, certainly commercial mortgage lenders have also been offering forbearance, um, to their, uh, their clients in this case, in an effort to help them with, you know, the COVID situation. Um, if I think I remember well, and I believe, uh, Bert, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I believe you, you had heard a specific statistic, something on the order of, I think, was what, 15 to 20 percent potentially um, would be in the commercial market, in this case, offering some form of forbearance in terms of their lending products. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's uh, that, that, ha that was the, the trend to say six months ago. I don't uh, I think those have been a number of those have been worked through. But um, but yes, that was the kind of high water mark was in the 15 to 20 percent range, um, you know, depending on the nature of the credit. You know, certainly that's a that's a basket of credits. So I mean, that includes everything from, you know, hospitality establishments to you know some commercial real estate, et cetera. So it's a it's a mishmash, but that was the the general impact. Any more questions or comments? Um, do I hear a motion to approve resolution six? Uh, this is John Harrity. I, I uh, move to approve resolution six. And uh, do I hear a second? Second, it's Matt. Matt? Oh, great. Thanks, Matt. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Oppose? Any abstentions? 
Excellent. Okay, moving on. And Chair Reed, this is Brian. Um, so it, it's just to speed the meeting up a little bit, if we can, we'll just move by this uh, agenda item 6B double I, and then I've asked both Sergio and Matt uh, Masunas to keep it short so that we can get into executive session. So we'll, if we could move right to agenda item seven, that would be great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was gonna ask you that. Um, so, so this is, um, and Sergio Carrillo is going to give us an update. I think this is something we're all interested in. Where are we with the uh, our battery storage progress? Um, Sergio? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Sergio Carrillo. Um, so let's let me try to be brief in this uh, update of Docket 171203 RE03, which is battery storage. Um, uh, just a quick uh, review of the timeline. Back in May, uh, Pura issued a request for design proposal. The Green Bank filed its solarized storage proposal in July. Um, and for your reference, we were contemplating uh, to deploy 50 megawatts of battery storage in five years. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Pura issued a straw proposal and requested comments uh, by January 26th, that's next Tuesday. Um, and they're targeting March 22nd for a draft decision. Next slide, yes. Uh, um, so high level uh, overview in terms of size and the length of the program, Pure is considering a nine year program that contemplates 290 megawatts of uh, battery storage capacity for residential customers, 290 megawatts of storage for CNI customers for a total of 580 megawatts. That's 10 times what we had proposed in our uh, filing. So it, it's quite a uh, um, ambitious program. Um, from a compensation perspective, let me just keep a couple of items here. From a compensation perspective, um, the program contemplates an upfront incentive administered by the Green Bank. Uh, it will be, it will have a declining block structure similar to that of RCIP and a performance-based incentive that will be administered by the utilities. Um, related to ownership, basically uh, homeowners, TPOs or EDCs will be uh, able to own the systems. And uh, probably the most contentious aspect of the of the implementation of the program will be the operational control mode. Basically, who gets to decide when and how to dispatch the energy stored in the batteries. So that's a, at a very high level, the scope of the program. Um, is there any questions about that? All right. So what's the what's the um, uh, potential roles for the Green Bank? In the, in the design, implementation, and management of this program. Well, Pure is recommending that we are, uh, that we be uh, the program administrator in conjunction with the EDCs. We can support the review approval process uh, of, of, of the program very much in the way we do our SIP with installations, approvals, inspections, and so forth. Um, and uh, we can support the performance measurement and reporting. Um, next slide, please. We will be responsible for marketing and promoting the program. Um, and we can use some of the resources we already have in place, like Solar CT, Solar for All, Sustainable Connecticut, and, and others. Uh, paying special attention to ensuring the participation of LMI customers in the program. Um, the way the way Pura described the Green Bank in the docket, and, and, and I'm going to quote, they say uh, CGB is the leader in collecting and making program data and compensation levels publicly available. So we will be responsible for data collection and sharing. And uh, there are many metrics that we can we we provided in our filing. Um, and uh, 
again, we as program administrators will be asked to to evaluate, measure, and verify the results of the program. Uh, do the uh, EMNV, including uh, ongoing benefit cost analysis and others. Very importantly, um, we are expected to make recommendations on how to incorporate into the program um, vulnerable communities, LMIM medical hardship customers, um, grid edge customers uh, who are those in areas that are prone to power outages, critical facilities, and increased emission uh, reductions. So what are we doing right now? Uh, we're meeting with different stakeholders, manufacturers, uh, third-party owners, contractors, installers, trade associations, uh, to prepare our response again due next Tuesday. Um, I think our role will be, we will play a key role in the administration of a battery storage program uh, over the next few years. Is there any questions, Brian? Is there anything you want to add, Brian Salia? No, so yeah, we need to speed it along, but if there are members of the board who want to go in further, we're we'll happy to do it uh, outside the meeting. Um, we're going to start to lose board members here in a second, so yeah. let's just uh, move it up. Well, a quick update on the renewable energy tariff. The uh, tariff uh, represents the transition from net metering and RCIP to a tariff-based compensation for solar systems in the state. Uh, next slide. Brian, uh, throughout the process, we, we made multiple recommendations right, that would foster the sustained orderly development of the solar industry in the state. And uh, it, it's gratifying to see that many of our recommendations were adopted by Pura in their decision. Um, among others, is Pura adopted a 10% rate of return uh, for residential solar systems that will uh, result in a tariff of about 29 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, Pure is implementing additional comp compensation for low and moderate income households of 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the proposal requires energy assessment, HES, in all projects, allows for uh, uh, on-bill financing. And as I mentioned before, Pura considers um, the Green Bank the gold standard when it comes to data transparency. So there will be uh, stricter requirements for data collection and reporting on the, on the, uh, for EDCs. Um, and battery storage will be incentives from the docket that I just mentioned will be added to the tariff. Um, next slide, please. And to wrap this up, um, uh, we need to recognize that the role of the Green Bank is changing from a very active role as a program administrator to a more of a supportive advisory role. Um, so we will provide support in the development of the residential TARP guidelines, advice EDCs on data collection and sharing, work with PURAs uh, to advise and educate contractors. There's no immediate action items at this point for us um, and that everything is on the on the uh, on the EDCs to meet a series of deadlines from here until January of 2022. Great. Thank yep. you, Serge. Yeah, no problem. Uh, if I could ask a board members, definitely send me an email. Happy to do offline and go into more detail. Lots of great stuff here. Final takeaway, Pura has run an excellent process to get a number of feedback and stakeholders involved in New Britain. They got a lot of great ideas and they're incorporating those ideas to meet the public policy objectives of the state. So uh, we're gonna, looking at things today, the Green Bank will continue to play a very catalytic role in mobilizing more private investment into new market segments. So we're really excited uh, by, by it all. Um, maybe if we could just go to uh, other business real quickly, Matt, <laughs> one minute. Oh, yeah. just one minute. I'll use my best terms and conditions, cadence, President Garcia, and just force mute me uh, in a moment um, because this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first item here actually follows right along from the storage REO3 docket almost simultaneously. Uh, Pura put out a straw proposal for a utility centric uh, electric vehicle charging uh, set of programs for the 2020s. 
um, which would presumably be approved by 2022 and be implemented, allowing them to subsidize and rate base the cost of EV charger deployment. So staff's in the midst of brainstorming some complementary roles for the Green Bank on that. Uh, second bullet, we've examined transit and school bus financing. It's in our most recent comprehensive plan, and uh, it's not uh, fully ready yet uh, in the near term for financings because after examination, we determined that there's additional barriers uh, that need to be overcome to help scale deployment. Uh, at least on the transit side, um, they're federally subsidized quite heavily. Uh, they have a greater need around operational budget management than upfront cost. Uh, with school buses, the characteristics of the market, it's mostly third party owned, uh, are such that it requires a great amount of community demand and maybe even uh, a statutory ability to contract further than the five year cap uh, for school districts right now so that the fuel and maintenance savings and ancillary grid services through the batteries can accrue long enough to support a cost neutral case right there. Third bullet, uh, charge up CT buildings. It's recently been extended to April 30th. This is a promotional CPACE campaign that uses interest earnings on financings to support a marketing expense in line with state policy. So namely, it provides free recharging insta excuse me, installations to uh, new financings of sufficient amount. So uh, it's helps spur demand and it also um, serves state policy in putting EV chargers out there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll assume 20 seconds. Uh, so. Uh, this is a pilot transaction. We expect to bring it to fruition around mid-2021. Uh, essentially, it brings streams of fee revenue into Connecticut from out of state. Uh, so after helping create the protocol to measure emission savings from driving electric, approved in 2018, and after we began regulatory engagement here and elsewhere on it, we started our project with a group of partners. Uh, we published a milestone on the project in December, uh, where it's almost like a co-op function where we're partnering with businesses in the value chain for EV charging who have a line of sight on the charging data and also a clear line of title to the environmental attribute of the charging transactions. The think like we get with Rex and Arsic. Uh, so they can assign that to us and we can help others transact that value and voluntary carbon offset markets easier than they can do uh, themselves. You'll see uh, the shadings on the map. It's based on quintile number of enrolled chargers. California is called out because we're not double counting against their LCFS cap. Connecticut chargers, there's 27 so far, mostly installed in 2019. Uh, we're working upstream to help grow the market more generally. So in turn, uh, Connecticut can also be a beneficiary right there. Um, the last slide after that, I won't linger on, but that just captures the essence of the partner onboarding process for us. It's a, a really nuanced world. So we're looking to simplify that explanation as much as possible. Uh, so that'll do it for me. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. All right, gang. So, so thank you for your patience. So we're, we're about to go into executive session. And before, uh, Lonnie, we, uh, you ask for a motion to move into do an executive session. Let me just tell you what's going to happen. Um, I think we'll still have a quorum. Um, so um, I'm going to pause the meeting um, in terms of recording. Uh, I'm then going to lock the meeting for everybody who's in it now. I will then start to remove people uh, who shouldn't be in executive session. Um, for those of you who get removed, feel free to log back in. Uh, you'll then be put in the lobby, and when we reconvene uh, the meeting, you will be able to come back in. Um, so from there, we'll be able to hold executive session. So uh, Lonnie, if you want to um, uh, uh, move a motion to go into executive session, I will begin to uh, take uh, these steps. Okay, do I hear a motion to move into executive session? Uh, this is so John moved. Herity, so moved. Great, and who, who was the other so moved? Tom Flynn. Okay, Tom, so that's uh, our second is Tom. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, blah, 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 blah. All right, okay, into good. executive session we go. Excellent. Give me a second to start working all these. This conference will now be recorded. All right, all set for you, Chair Reed. Thank you. Hello again. Um, so do I hear a motion to approve resolution four?
Uh, John Harley, so moved. Thank you, John. Thank you, Benu. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, resolution four is approved. And I think that brings us to the end of our journey today. There's no other business, is there, Brian? That's correct. Thank you everyone for your patience on that uh, additional 15 minutes there, 20 minutes. Okay. Move to adjourn. So, thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. I got to jump. Bye -bye. Take care, everybody.